podcast. All right, guys, welcome back. This is episode 147. We got a quick intro today. Trev is out bow fishing, and I got a lot of stuff to do, so we're going to cut right through this and get you right into the show. Let's jump right in and thank our sponsors, starting with Huntworth. You can find that over at huntworthgear.com. We just posted our YouTube opinion review of the lightweight system, and uh, we'd appreciate it if you guys went over there, check that out. Make sure you subscribe, like the video, leave a comment, share it with friends. Uh, the more the merrier. It makes it a little easier for us to keep bringing stuff to you. Bowfishing Magazine, bowfishingmagazine.com. If you want the latest and greatest in the bowfishing world, all in a digital package, it's an online magazine. Go right to bowfishingmagazine.com. You can scroll through and see everything going on. Nor'easter Game Calls. You can find Mark's work over at nor'eastergamecalls.com. We do have the new series coming out, so get ready for the uh, the Jurassic series. It's going to be pretty sweet. And we also want to thank our partners, latitudeoutdoors.com. That's Latitude Outdoors. They make some of the most incredible saddle hunting equipment on the market. We will be doing an episode with them upcoming at the end of this month, so stay tuned for that. They're going to release some new items and tell you all about them, so make sure to check that out. Zeus Broadheads, New Era Archery, NewEraArchery.com. Definitely the best broadhead on the market. I highly recommend you guys check them out. We've preached them for years, but uh, don't knock them till you try them. Vital Ground Outdoors, if you guys caught last week's episode... You kind of got to just for what Matt's all about, and uh, there will be a lot more coming. So you guys stay tuned from there. Make sure you get over there and show him some support at VitalGroundsOutdoors.com. We also want to take a minute and emphasize an event that's coming up. We will be doing a full show overview podcast about it. But just to get you guys going now, we're talking about hunt stock. It's Friday, August 12th through the 14th at Wildwood Farm in Westminster, Mass. So it's going to be big. Think Woodstock, but instead of music, it's going to be outdoor media. And it's going to be fun and games and camping and food and vendors and prizes. And uh, we'll get all into that in the show when we do that. So stay tuned. And uh, if you have any more questions, reach out. We'll get you some context. And last but not least, let's get caught up with what's going on in the world. Bringing you the news for the cruise is our good buddy, Mike Salter. Take it away, Mike. Hey, everyone. We're going to start this one off in Nebraska, where the Game and Parks has rejected uh, proposed turkey hunt changes, even after a decline of 45% from the population's peak in 2008 to 2010. In fall 2014, nearly 70% of permit holders were successful, and last year that fell to 46%. And postseason surveys saw 7% of hunters say they would not hunt turkeys again in Nebraska due to their 2021 experience. The Game and Parks Commissioner, Big Game Program Manager, in response to this, recommended restrictions to the 2023 fall and spring turkey hunts, including smaller bag and permit limits, and a shortened fall season. The changes would have reduced the fall season by six weeks and cut the bag limits from two to one, in the fall and cut the spring uh, limit from three to two birds. Hunters and Game and Park commissioners voiced that the changes did not go far enough. Therefore, the commissioners voted against the recommendations on the premise that they didn't do enough to minimize the impact on the turkey population. Commissioners asked for the rev- for a revised plan that will further reduce the fall hen harvest and minimize the impact for the spring season. The plan is to have new recommendations for the commission's August meeting. Uh, So more to come on some big changes in Nebraska. Uh, The commission did approve the mountain lion season, which uh, lowered tags from 320 to 200 to try to increase the length of the season and uh, boost hunter satisfaction uh, on the lion season. And the commission also approved the state's second ever river otter trapping season, which will run from November 1st through February 28th uh, or until 125 otters are harvested. Now to Oklahoma, where the Wildlife Conservation Commission has approved additional opportunities to harvest antlerless deer. The coming, uh, this coming December, the holiday antlerless deer gun season will now be expanded to include Zone 10 in the southeastern corner of the state, which has been traditionally closed uh, for the holiday season. 
there will be a limit of two antlerless deer in zone 10 during that holiday antlerless gun season. Now to Arizona, where you can now uh, set up your hunting and fishing licenses automatically uh, to automatically renew uh, upon expiration, which is great. And now the Arizona Game and Fish Department has created a new step-by-step -step video to assist folks on setting this up to ensure that your licenses are set up correctly and do automatically renew. That video can be found on the Arizona Game and Fish YouTube page, so check that out and get those updated. Now to Montana, where interested hunters can now register online for game damage hunt rosters through July 15th. These rosters are used by the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks to quickly respond to landowners who are eligible for game damage assistance in the prevention or reduction of property or crop damage primarily caused by deer, elk, and or antelope. And new for this year, hunters can register to be placed on a bison game damage roster, which has been approved with a set quota of 10 bison in Region 3. These hunts could occur in warmer months and will require quick field dressing and a team of people prepared to assist. Uh, hunters can register by logging into their MyFWP account or click on the look up uh, draw results and register for lists link in the menu. And then select the preferred hunt districts and species. Hunters are asked to sign up for districts where they have where they know the landscape and can respond quickly uh, to game damage issues within 24 to 48 hours. The rosters will be uh, posted to my FWP accounts by July 20th, and Fish, Wildlife, and Parks will contact hunters if they are selected for a damage hunt opportunity by phone or email. So make sure that your uh, contact information is up to date in your my FWP account. Also, those interested in surplus drawing licenses and permits in Montana can now sign up through July 20th for deer and elk permits, elk B and deer B licenses uh, through the My uh, FWP or the FWP website. Uh, the resulting surplus license list will be randomized and hunters will uh, at the top of the list will be contacted uh, with instructions to finalize their purchase within a specified amount of time. You will also be able to sign up for a surplus list for antelope, antelope B, crane, and special mountain lion uh, from August 9th to the 23rd of this year, so look out for that. Now to Arkansas, where anyone interested in pursuing alligators uh, has through June 30th at midnight to submit an application for the 2022 alligator season. Applicants will need to apply for one of the six hunting locations within two of the three open alligator management zones. There will be 43 permits available for the public draw, and the permit authorizes the harvest of one alligator, at least four feet in length, and hunting is allowed from 30 minutes after sunset to until 30 minutes before sunrise from September 16th to the 19th and September 23rd to the 26th. The cost is a $5 non-refundable fee for the application. Lastly, to Ohio, where applications for controlled public land hunting opportunities will be accepted beginning July 1st, these hunts uh, provide special chances to pursue deer, waterfowl, doves, pheasant, squirrel, and quail. The Division of Wildlife offers hunts to adults, youth, uh, mobility impaired, and uh, hunters with apprentices. And each application, application requires a $3 non-refundable fee. Hunters may apply for more than one hunt, but can only apply to each hunt once per year. There will also be firearm and archery hunts uh, available. So as always, if you have anything to send me, it'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, keep sending that news along. Reach out to me at Mike Salter on Facebook or Bearded underscore Bowhunter 21 on Instagram. And with that, enjoy the rest of your ride. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate it as always. This is a really good episode that builds on our early season preparation. Uh, we dive into deer glands, deer scents, licking branches, mock scrapes, uh, the works. And I highly recommend you guys take notes if this is something you do. Some of the techniques that are described in it are real relevant, and uh, I can definitely see how you could put this to use to increase your success this fall. So without further ado, we're just going to jump right into it.
All right, we're back on the phone with Brian. Well, I guess are we on the phone or <laughs> who knows where we are? We're, we're mobile. <laughs> we're mobile. <laughs> we like mobile. We're on the drive, as we as we like to say. Brian, how are you, man? You there? I'm doing great, thanks. Yeah, we're about uh, a mile and a half from uh, you know the homestead where we actually have internet service. Yes. Well, it's kind of, us as outdoorsmen, we like the you know the quietness and the backwoods of nothing but until we have to do something in the technical world then it becomes a serious problem right yeah yeah and like i said it it is i can i can hook up any cellular trail camera at my house but to to do a a podcast or a zoom or anything else like that it seems like it's you know a black a black hole well why don't we we we, we may do with the situation. That's right. <laughs> Us as survivalist outdoorsmen, we kind of deal with the situations as they come, right? That's right. Deal with it as it goes. Yep. Well, why don't we turn this key, man? Why don't we get this thing underway? Why don't you tell everybody who you are, where you're from, and what you do? Okay. Uh, my name is Brian Keitlinger. I'm from Northwest Pennsylvania. Um, I'm a freelance outdoor writer, blogger. Um, kind of got uh, my hand in a bunch of other stuff, but my day job, I'm an eighth grade social studies teacher. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. 27 years. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Been doing it for about 27 years. So I, I, I actually, I love it. Um, we, you know, we, we've been live, uh, full school, everything, um, you know, since the pandemic, we were out that, that first little part whenever they closed. But since then, we've been we've been 100% live uh, in the classroom with the kids, and it's it, it's been it's been great. It's so, you know, you just got to roll with the punches. See, and I I, I I find that real interesting actually because one of my biggest influences in my hunting career was my eighth grade social studies teacher. I used there to go, go out and he, yeah, he I, would pay me $5 a bull and we would go out and film bulls and I'd bring the film back and we'd run through it. And if he could find a bull that he could take a client out and guide on, he'd give us $5. And that's what that's ultimately awesome. got us sucked into hunting was going out and filming elk. So funny combination. Yeah. yeah pred predominantly, I'd say about 75% of the kids I teach, um, hunt fish camp and uh our trap team this year actually won states so that was that was a that was a big thing and you know the kids are the same way i i take all my magazines into school and put them in a big pile and they root through them and they're like can i have it yep go ahead you can have it and uh you know they they do a good job trying to get me off task especially <laughs> during late october and everything um you know about different things especially you know we have to have our our phones on vibrate or whatever in the classroom and they'll hear it vibrating on my desk oh did you get pictures i'm like yeah we'll look at them between classes so they <laughs> they know what's going on but uh but yeah a, a few years ago um i started my own kind of brand or whatever i uh, called left in the field outdoors and um so i've been doing speaking engagements and i've written a i've written a few books and um you know i've had the pleasure of writing some some articles for some different uh magazines and it was really kind of even on a dare that someone said you should send some of this stuff to some people and i was like yeah, okay whatever and you know things just kind of fell into place that um you know i've i've been able to meet a lot of great people and make a lot of great connections and um they like what i have to write so i just keep giving them giving them stuff um i'm the uh assistant director for the state of pennsylvania for the northeast big buck club um, so I get to, I get to score all kinds of great deer every year. Um, meet a lot of people, hear a lot of good stories and, um, you know, spend a lot of time away from home, uh, doing things in, in the outdoor, uh, industry and everything else. So it, it, it is, it's, it's been a lot of fun. So what, what? that's a teacher's influence the world needs. 
like that we just you know we just try you know um <laughs> you're, you're one of the few it sounds like <laughs> well i don't know we, we we got we have a great school we have a lot of great teachers and you know to knock knock on wood i haven't had covid i had i i had i didn't miss a day of school in the last two um my wife just had covid and my daughter did and um none of us are vaccinated so i mean it's it, it just is what it is. So, but yeah, you just, you know, like when it's flu season, you go to school and be like, yeah, I'll probably get the flu this year. You know, it, it is what it is. It is, what it is. is. Just, just go with it. Yep. 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 If it's my time to go, I, I don't know who I'm going to argue with. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, at least as long as you're not missing out on deer season, I guess it's not a problem, right? <laughs> no, no, it, it's, it's not. And like I said, I, Two years ago, well, the first summer of COVID, um, I actually tore my hamstring off my pelvis. Ooh. Um, and I had to have a surgery get sewed back on and this and that and everything. And I, and I told my doctor, I said, listen, I don't care what you do. So, but I, I need to be ready to hunt by the first week of October because that's when deer season. And he's like, yeah, that ain't, that ain't going to happen. Well, first day of deer season, I was in the stand because I done all my, did all my rehab, did everything. And. Uh, he's like, yep, you can go. So yeah, I didn't, didn't want to be left out of the deer season just because of the, having the hamstring suit on. So yeah, you've got, <laughs> as you've got, he you've says with yourself. like, it's nothing. <laughs> yeah. Just a hamstring. But, yeah. <laughs> just a hamstring. Yeah. It's, you know, no, nothing that they don't fix every day. Not really. So what kind of got you into the whole blogging and the free freelance writing and stuff like that? Like, where did that all start for you, Brian? Well, I, I, I loved writing when I was growing up and, um, I, I used to do a bunch of short stories and this and that and everything else. And, uh, I actually had my fourth grade, um, English teacher told me that I was horrible at writing and I should stop. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Um, and so I've, I don't know, I've always journaled, and wrote stuff down about seasons and, and everything. And when I started, uh, probably about 2010, when I started scoring deer for the Northeast Big Buck Club, uh, one of my buddies is like, you should start doing a, a blog or a podcast or, or something so people can see all these deer you're scoring. Nah, nah. So I, I built my own website and did a bunch of stuff. And, uh, you know, I posted a few videos and I was like, dang, that, that video got 800 and some views just for someone's, someone's deer. And then um, uh, my buddy, Steve Sorensen, um, you know, said, hey, I know you've been writing some things here and there. Um, you know, if you have any stuff that you can get published or anything, uh, you could look at joining the Pennsylvania Outdoor Writers Association, which is, you know, um, professional outdoor writers, bloggers, all that other stuff. And um, I had written probably half a dozen, dozen articles for the Northeast Big Buck Club because we have our own magazine publication. And I said, well, here, these, these were all published. And, you know, that turned into writing for um, bowhunting.net. Uh, unfortunately, it's not there anymore. And um, the first year that I went uh, and started submitting work for a Pennsylvania Outdoor Writers Association, I won, I won an award for an article I did on, on my daughter. And then uh, that was 2019. And every year since, I've, I've, been able, I've been able to win a few other awards here and there. And I don't know, when one, one um, editor will suggest, you know, hey, you know, this guy has some good stuff contact him or uh, other people I'll just say hey I got this story you know would you be interested in publishing it and everything so I mean I I probably write two three times a week a lot of it sometimes is just a jumbled mess of of stuff or ideas I have and I I used to, I used to actually write a lot of poetry which I which I still do and have some have had some outdoor poetry stuff published um but yeah it's just you know i i for a few years i taught so many periods of social studies and then i actually taught um writing 
And so I think that kind of got me back into doing some more stuff with the writing. But, you know, you get you get more to um, no's from magazine companies than what you do yeses. And when it, it's funny because I'm like, man, I think this is a really good one. And I'll share it with, with people at school. I'll be like, hey, just edit this for content, whatever you want to do. And they're like, oh, this is great. We love it. And you know, I'll send it to people. They're like, mm, no, we don't like that one. And then I'll send them one. I'm like, all right, I have this other one. They're like, oh, we love that one. And I'm like, all right, I guess it fits a, a niche or something, uh, you know, somewhere. So, yeah, that's, I guess, just kind of a in and out and a mess of, of stuff. But I've always, I've always just written and have kept notes and journals and, um, you know, things about the, things about the season, what I'm seeing, and you know, I don't know. I guess my my grandfather used to write things down and put things all over the place, and he was a huge influence on my life. So I guess I maybe kind of, you know, got a little bit from him. But mostly that stuff was fishing. Hey, we went here. Let's write this stuff down. You know, when what time were we there? What day? And when we were catching fish and everything. I'm like, all right, whatever. So that's you know just kind of a a goofy thing that that I guess I've gotten myself into. Absolutely. And so what was, you know, one of the things that kind of draws my attention to you, especially this time of year, and I know we've talked back and forth about it, is that, you know, the nonverbal white-tailed deer communication, that book that you had wrote, like it's it's just something that's seriously on my mind. So what was kind of like the purpose of you writing that book and kind of what kind of took you into the tolls of doing it? Well, uh it, you can thank COVID for that. When when we went to virtual school, um, Smokey McNichols, who has uh, Smokey's Deer Lore, um, I started using his stuff back in 2011. And between 2011 and now, there's only been one year that I haven't killed a buck out of a mock scrape. Uh, and that year that I didn't, both my kids killed deer out of a mock scrape I had made um, actually the same stand, same mock scrape about three weeks apart. And, uh, Smokey reached out to me and Steve Sorensen had, had done a book for Smokey before, but just on free orbital. And, um, Smokey's like, Hey, you think you could do a how-to book for me on all these gland lores and stuff that, you know, you're using and, you know, you seem to have a good system down. And I was like, Oh, okay. So I literally during COVID, um, sat down and I wrote this, I wrote this book and I, and I sent him the pdf of it and he's like yeah um, you gotta take that 230 pages and knock it down to about 60 <laughs> and i was like oh so i went back and and redid the the whole book because he re he really just wanted it uh uh you know where is the gland located what does it do um you know and and how to use it in how I've used it or what experience I've had um, using it. So I said, here's, here's the, here's the book here. And I actually just created an ebook and put it on my website. Um, Cause a, a buddy of mine showed me how to do that. And it's actually all in color, which, which is nice. This is all black and white, but um, everything starts off with a little story of something I've experienced and had would ask myself, why, why in the world did that happen? Why did that deer do that? Why, why did it, you know, why, why did it do it? I mean, I used to make mock scrapes with all kinds of stuff. I used to start mock scrapes with WD-40. And I said, well, we used to use it for fishing and we'd spray it on and it has an oil in it. You'd see it on the water. And I used to spray hemlock trees with WD-40 and start mock scrapes. Um, and they'd get hit for a little bit and then they'd be, you know, they'd, they'd fizzle out. So there was something in, that oil that's in the WD-40 that, that they had, but a lot of it was just trial and error and talking with Smokey going, Hey, this is what I experienced today. You know, let's think this through and what's going on. And it's just been evolved. It, it's evolved into, you know, Smokey and I probably talk once a week the whole way through the year. Um, you know, cause I, I start mock scrapes in, in March and run them all year round and we constantly monitor them and, and he's always asked me, Hey, try this, try that. You know, what are you getting from that? And so, I mean, it is, it, it, that book is really about 10, 12 years of personal data and information and stuff gathered and trial and error stuff that uh, we put into a book and basically said, you know, 
if you get this, you can understand where all the glands are, how deer use them and how you can use them, um, you know, to hopefully get yourself in line with a nice big buck for, for the season. And uh, so that, that's, that's kind of where it, it took off from. And uh, I've, I've had the pleasure of doing a few seminars with Smokey. And every time I talk with him, I, I think I learn um, more things that, um, that I don't know. And every time I go out in the woods, um, there are things that uh, I pick up and learn. And uh, I have a few friends who are deer farmers and just go in there and sit and watch and is probably one of the, the biggest things that where I sit and just kind of pick things up and, and, and learn more about how they act and, and what they do. So it's kind of a big, just mess of, of, of different things and going and trying, and, trying and new, trying new stuff. He's always bringing out new products and, and everything. So we actually, this is the second edition of this book. He wanted me to go back and add some stuff that we tested the last few years um with some mock scrapes and some other things so we um after having the book up for two years he, he made me redo it and add a bunch of other stuff so <laughs> so we got the second edition out but it's it's actually a good thing because the other book we're gonna uh use with um uh the company buckstick which i've I've done a bunch of stuff for and um, have had a lot of success with as as well so it's yeah it's just kind of a, a mad scientist of it What's the worst that can happen? It either works or it doesn't. And if you spook a big buck, well, go find another one and, <laughs> and see if you can get on it. So it just, you know, it's it's just trial trial and error. And and to be honest, I was getting tired of paying. I was spending a ton of money on urine. Right. And using a bottle of urine, you know, every two or three days, and not getting not really getting results or anything I wanted. Um, so, you know, Glanlor, a so, small one and a half ounce bottle of Glanlor usually lasts me about two years. So what do you, what is like your recommendation? Like, so if you were to start a, a mock scrape today, what, yep. what would be your steps to doing so? Um, like, is there an area to start at or how do you go about it? And what do you do? What glands do you use on this to, to kind of maximize the results? Okay. Um, so actually there, there are three things that I, that I, I, I look for. Number one is timing. I like to time it at the very beginning of the spring, just as the so snow's melting. And, um, that's when I start my mock scrapes because, you know, bucks are starting to get back in the bachelor groups. You're starting to see nubs and stuff already. And it, if what I've seen is if there's been a nice buck killed in that area, the deer know it. And a, another nice buck moves back in, or you start to beginning to see the pecking order of, of deer, you know, that are, are going to try and be the big guy on the block. So timing, timing is a big thing. Um, location, it's like, re, it's like real estate, location, location, location. Um, I know my property pretty well since it's only 12 acres. Um, pinch points outside of bedding areas in natural funnels is, is, where I, is, is where I do my mock scrapes. And um, any, any main trail that I know that they are constantly on, um, I will do a mock scrape on there. And sometimes I'll even do two or three uh, in a row, about 20 yards apart, just because um, when you're using gland, it's, it's, it's essentially you're introducing a brand new deer. And then lastly, the thing I do is I make it look as realistic as possible. You know, I, I, I take time, I go in and I chew up the dirt real good. I make usually like a pretty decent size. And... Um, you want to you want deer to come hit your scrape you got to look around and look for any other overhanging branches that are where a deer could get to and cut them out so that that scrape is the only place that they can go it's a one-stop shop you they know who's hitting it who's there what's going on and it's the only place because i've cleared out any other branch that they can get in there and and, and rub or you know or deposit any uh type of gland or anything on so there really is kind of a method, a method to the madness, I guess you could say. But yeah, that's that's what I would do. I'd I'd be looking for those things starting early, um, you know, making it look natural and looking looking for those outside of the bedding areas, funnels, and and um, you know, main travel corridors. So that's 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 the best place to start. And then, you know, 
the glands I would use this early, uh, it would be predominantly preorbital and um, buck or doe interdigital. And people, you know, I'll hang, I'll go and make a scrape um, and then I'll turn my cameras on and I use uh, spy point cellular cameras. And it's not uncommon for me to have anywhere between an hour to four hours after I leave the uh, uh, of deer in that scrape. And the trick to that is um, I put interdigital gland lore on my boots after I've made the scrape and I walk the main trail about 30 yards up directly to the, to the mock scrape. So it's like a deer has just been there. It's gone there. It's going to that, uh, going to that scrape. So doe and buck interdigital are, are a key part of that. And, you know, in the book, there's an easy way. We, we put cotton balls on the bottom of our boots with the thumbtacks and you just put a little bit of interdigital because every time a deer walks, it's leaving its individual unique scent from its interdigital gland. So that's how you can really kind of fire up or get a deer coming directly to your scrape right away. Uh, introduce a little bit of interdigital gland lore on your boots and, and walk it in. I'd say 99% of the time when I go into the woods, um, I always have interdigital gland lore with me and I put it on my, say my boots real good and I put it on my boots so they don't get much of a human scent if it's 100% possible because we know how hard it is. But they're getting, hey, there's there's a deer that's walked through here. There's a deer that's here. Um, you know, where did it go and what's it what's it doing? So that's that's probably the easiest and the best way to do it. Just know your property, and you, as long as you don't use a, a ton of it. There, I've I've never had a deer spook. Uh oh, here come two deer right now. <laughs> Yeah, yep. So as he's um, talking, he's sitting I've, over a cornfield. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've, I've never, I've never had a deer spook, um, uh, at, at, at a, at a new mock scrape. They just, they just know that, Hey, there's a new deer here. And because it's March and deer start to disperse and, and go to different areas, you know, they don't know who it is and it, it piques their interest and, you know, they continue to come back to see who that is. Once I start a scrape, if you're hitting it regularly, I, I don't I don't go back and bother it. Um, if if I notice two or three weeks nothing's been in it, I can freshen it up. But um, you know, a lot of the pictures and stuff I get even right now, I haven't. Uh, two days ago was the first day I went to another farm I hunt that's 40 acres, and freshened up my my mock scrapes, and that was the first time I've done it since October. Because they're doing all the work for you. Every time they they put it in their mouth or hit it with their face or hit it with their eye or take a leak in the in the scrape, they're doing all the work for you. That's that's why, again, you get away with using a, a half-ounce bottle. Let's see what we got. And I know it's getting dark, but there's Smokey's Preorbital. It's a half-ounce bottle. And there's eh, – it's probably a half left. This bottle is going on, on its second year. Because when you when you make your scrapes, you don't use you don't use but a tiny few drops to get it going. So, so you're putting the 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 preorbital. Is it going right inside of the scrape, or are you putting it on the licking branch, or where does that go? And then you put your yep. digital inside of the scrape, right? Yep. yep. The digital goes in the scrape, and like I said, once I once I make the scrape, um, you know, I'll stand in it. And um, I'll put the pre over on my licking branch or um, I've started using grapevines because we have a ton of them around our mm -hmm. place. And what I've, what I've found is that um, I can put some horizontal notches in that grapevine and it holds the pre orbital really well. And I put that pre orbital in the grape on the grapevine or on my licking branch. And once I have that done, I re rake my scrape out and I put the buck in your digital or dough in or digital. And then I said that what I'll do is I'll put cotton balls and stuff on my boots and I'll walk in all different directions as it's, you know, deer coming right to that, to that scrape. So, and, and it's, it's neat. You can see deer. I have video and stuff where deer will, our predominant winds out of the, the West here. Um, you'll see deer that come down wind of it and they will turn on a dime and come right in and, and come come right to the scrape so it's you know it, you, you just 
constant intel and, and constant video and, and watching, you'll you'll pick you'll pick things up and you know, I I've I've had does come in and bed down between my mock scrapes waiting for a buck to come breed it because she's an estrus and the bucks are going around all over the place and you know they'll they'll come in and and bed down in between your scrape they'll even they'll even wait and you know this time of year a lot of your scrape action is actually from the does they they hit the scrapes all the time and then what's neat is you'll see these little 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 tiny fawns going in and if the fawns go into the scrape and know what they do what they're doing you know how natural it is that they and you know the interdigital the preorbital and later on they'll you know do the forehead like deer aren't rubbing things right now so I, I really kind of don't use a whole lot of a forehead at all i start to introduce that more towards the end of summer um when they still have velvet on stuff like that but they're just starting to get ready to to key up and start you know hitting their forehead early season as well i'll use uh metatarsal which sometimes times you know it, it kind of smells like stinky cheese but um <laughs> good description you know yeah, on the outside of the back of their leg, um, you know, there's a tuft of hair there, and there's actually a gland in there. And then it, some people are actually saying that their deer are naturally phasing that gland out, but it's very territor very territorial. If you if you can pinpoint a uh, a mature buck and know where his bedding area is, if you can get in there when he's not in there, and you can start using some metatarsal gland lore, I it it really gets them fired up and. Um, that's one. That's one of the the keys to using that very early on in in the season, um, you know. And again, as the season progresses, you get into the tarsal gland, and Smokey makes a really good tarsal gland lore. But he'll even tell you, you know, himself, if a buddy or someone you know kills a buck, have them cut the tarsals off, throw it in a, a freezer Ziploc bag, yep. put them in the freezer, and we I use I use them all the time, you know. Yeah, come middle of October, the rest of the way through, because it's a buck they don't know, and and you, from young bucks to old bucks, they 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 come looking uh, to see what's going on. So it's I run a, I run a safety pin right through them before I put them in in the freezer bag, and I take all the air out. So when I'm ready, the safety pin's on there, and you just slide the safety pin um, on a on a lower branch. I always put my tarsal glands about. I don't know, knee height of where they would actually be in a deer because it doesn't make sense to hang them six feet in a tree because that's not where deer's tarsal glands are located. Uh, <laughs> I learned that le I learned that lesson the hard way. Um, we won't make uh, you go nice, into that. <laughs> yeah, on a nice mature buck, you know, but um, when you think about it, you, you really just got to start thinking like a deer, you know, where their nose is at, where their glands are at, and presenting it to where you know where it needs to be for for them i, I want to take a step back real quick because the grapevine thing yep. um is something that i've started i started two days ago and mm -hmm. um so is there like a certain height to where you're putting it or you're using a natural one and cutting it and then making a scrape underneath it or are you tying it up because you've seen like I've seen different ways of doing it where they take the grapevine and it's like six feet tall and it, then they tie it up and they leave it at like hip height. So like what, what mm -hmm. is kind of like your input on it on how you use them? Okay. Uh, I started using grapevines back in like 2018 and it was just from walking by a, a logging road and there was four different scrapes underneath this, tree that had grapevines in four different spots so i pulled one of them down and i i used a um, zip tie and i moved it over and i created a mock scrape and i, I did i i had a, i had a box coming and hitting it um i got a oh there's a buck right there um <laughs> i do have a bunch of natural grapevines by my house so what i did the i started cutting them at four feet i'm i'm five ten so what I do, I actually made my own hanging system out of copper, a rubber coated copper wire. And like I said, and I, I can show you how to do it at some point in time if you want, it's pretty easy. Um, so that it can still move around, it has a lot of movement. But uh, I'm 5'10", I take it, it's four foot long, I hang it up 
and wrap it around so it hangs down uh, so that any deer that walks by, even smaller ones, can hit it in any way, shape, or form. And um, originally, I just started just using regular, you know, real grapevines. Um, over the past two years, I, st I started buying artificial leaves from Walmart and putting them on my grapevines. And it just, it just allows them more of an area to leave all of their scent. So you'll see in my pictures, like big, bright, orange fall leaves on, on my grapevines. And like, they come in, they put them in their mouth, they pull them off. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I do. I use natural grapevine and I don't think it matters the size. I have some that are as big as Coke bottles that I use and the bucks will get in there and smack them around and move them around. Um, and then I have ones that are probably half an inch in diameter that, um, that I use. It, it doesn't seem to matter. They don't seem to prefer one over the other. They just want a place to deposit that, that scent. Um, and if you cut your grapevines and go hang them immediately, there's a sweet water that drips out of the bottom of it into the scrape. And that's something that I feel dry, that brings them in right away as, as well too. So, you know, I, I call people that are near me. I'm like, Hey, I drove by your property. You got a bunch of great fun there. Can I go and cut some of there? Like, yeah, go ahead. So I've tried it where I have ones that I just cut. I've have ones that I've left in the basement for a year, uh, in garbage bags. So they don't get a whole lot of scent. Um, you know, that are drier. It doesn't seem to matter if it's in the right spot and it's doctored up, right. They, they, they have to, they, they have to come in and hit it. They, they're like, well, someone else left their scent there. You know, I got to do, I got to do that too, especially when you get into late summer where you're, you're starting to get the younger bucks. Goodness gracious, the younger bucks, you'll see them walk by and those 20 minutes later, come back and walk back by again. And then if another buck hits it, they'll get, they'll, I mean, it's, it's, it's nuts. I've, I've had a trail camera pictures at one point in time where I had four different three and a half to five and a half year old bucks just standing around looking at each other going, was well, it your turn? Are you going to hit it? Are you going to hit it? Are you going to, and they just, they just want to be that last one to, to hit it. And when they do, another one comes back to re reset over it. So yeah, the, the grapevines, you can go out and find some natural grapevines, you know, in the woods, hanging from old trees and stuff like that. You know, one buddy comes like my, my uncle has a great vineyard. I'm like, no, 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 no. Those are like actually like great vineyard. I said, these the, the vines that grow out in the wild that hang down from big oak trees. I said, those are the ones you want. I said, and if you can find a big section that's like 30, 40 foot long, I said, you have a gold mine, pull the whole thing down, cut it in four, four foot sections and you're ready to go. So I said, I don't know how tall you are. Uh, if you're taller than six foot, I'd probably make them, you know, four and a half feet long. But right. I, I, I have pictures, they'll stand up on their, their back feet and hit the grapevine with their hooves, uh, mark it with their inner digital gland as top as they, as they can at the top. So you want it, I've, I've put them on um, um, screen door springs, yeah. right? You can get screen door springs. I've found some that will fit up in there and I'll hot glue them up into there and hang them up so that they can move all back and forth. And I think the the bigger the spring is and it pushes back a little bit more, it kind of enjoy it a little bit. I mean, that's just kind of goofy stuff that I'm like, huh, I wonder if I put a spring on there and put it on there, if, if it would, you know, it just in a nice big Coke bottle size vine, they can really, you know, kind of push around. So there's just, you got to kind of just find what your, your deer, your deer like. But I think once they get into, you know, hitting them regularly they i mean they they hit them all the time i mean mm -hmm. I, I see scrapes all the time under grapevines so and i did i actually did a uh, last summer I, now there's three more deer last summer um i actually hung a uh oh, a three quarter inch piece of um unscented sisal rope uh, i actually talked to gene and barry wenzel uh, about stuff because they you know had this you know, big monster knot at the end of there and big rope. And, um, I put a vine and a rope basically 
five feet apart on the same branch. And we, we get a lot of rain in the summer. And I think, I think the deer quit hitting it because the rope gets mildew on it. And uh -huh. I'd say 90 to 95% of the deer went directly to the vine and left the rope alone. And like I said, you know, I, I soaked the rope in um, Wicked Wicks from Smokies, which is five different bucks in one. Because the one was like, you got to use like a whole bottle. Well, at 50 bucks a bottle, you're kind of putting things, you know, on the line there. But yeah, for, for me, where I live, the deer, the vine's natural and they see it all the time. So they would hit, they would hit the vine 95% more than what they did the, the rope. And like I said, uh, by the end of the year, when I go back, you could actually see mildew or mold on the rope. And I was like, oh, we're just taking this down and, and getting getting rid of it. So that's, you know, everyone's different out in the Midwest where it's a little drier and it stays a little bit more dry and, and, and everything. You know, a lot of people have a lot of success with, with the ropes in, in different areas. Um, so I'll say, you know, for me in Northwest Pennsylvania, I, I don't foresee myself using much rope again anymore at all. It's just not stick a, with what you know. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So I guess the the true question is, how do you use these these mock scrapes to your advantage come hunting season? Like, how are you killing these bucks over them? Like, what is kind of your setup with, you know, the deer coming downwind and so on and so yep. forth? So how are you setting up on these mock scrapes to be successful and, and actually killing these mature bucks on them? Okay. So I, I by the time uh, middle of October, towards the end of October, what I'll do is I will, um, I already have my stand set for, for my wind. And um, what I gradually do is start to add a few more scrapes, leading them. Well, again, a lot of them are funnels and pinch points. I don't have to lead them too much. They're already traveling there. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll start making a triangle of scrapes. My scrape that's been active the whole time is the top of my triangle. And then I have a, a scrape on my, on my left and on my right. And so no matter what direction the deer come from, there's an opportunity to them to hit any of those. And the newer scrapes basically signify to them, oh, there's another, if not two other deer in here. Um, you know, I need, I, need to check, I need to check these out. And, you know, so I usually what I'll do is I mark my preorbital bottles. I'll run one preorbital all summer. And then as it gets into hunting season, I'll switch pre-orbital because it's a completely different deer. Uh, so what you're doing is you're introducing a whole new deer. Um, and then if you want to have really a lot of fun, the way I make my vines with, with uh, the way I connect them, I, I have a 40-acre farm I hunt, and I have my 12-acre property. Um, last week of October, I switched the vines. I take the vine from this property, the other property, the other other. So I've introduced a whole freaking new herd of deer and add those, those triangle scrapes. And it, it really just seems to put them on, you know, high alert of, okay, I'm cruising looking for does. Where are all these other bucks coming from that are looking for does? Um, and again, he, along with using different apps, probably like everyone does looking for those, you know, rising moons, and and all that other stuff you can put it together and you know be in the right stand at the right time and i don't know i i've always had a habit of walking into the woods and looking and going i think that'd be a great place for a stand and looking around going yeah there's a trail there there's a trail there let's put it there and then i you know build my scrapes uh, around there but um you know there's some other products that i use from smoky that has have really kind of make this come to life um he introduced a new product last year and honest god i think it maybe should be illegal um it's doe inter doe interdigital gland lore with um 15 percent doe and heat mm -hmm. so what i i will put a doe decoy in the middle of my triangle of scrapes and i will use that doe interdigital with estrus and i'll use the cotton ball trick on my boots and i will walk the trail right to my decoy and then um i will just put the cotton balls actually on the inside of the decoy 
where they have the little cavity. And um, last year I, I killed, the first time I killed a buck with a decoy, um, I actually had to shoot my deer before it attacked it. And it got, it got one whiff of that scent trail. It came in and hit the first mock scrape, hit the second mock scrape, walked right to the decoy and I shot the deer at, I don't know, 15 yards. And uh, I called smoke, he's like, oh, that stuff's great. And I got it on a video. No, I didn't. I double, I double tapped my camera and missed it all. <laughs> oh, that's the worst. <laughs> oh, the I know that pain. Filming. Yeah, me so, too. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, there's just, you know, you you don't want to you don't want to allow bucks to get behind you, you know. So inside corners where they can't get behind you, um, with the wind in your favor, and you can make a triangle of, of scrapes, um, are really just a tactic that you know that I that I've been able to utilize on my, on my property. Uh, on the other property I hunt, I've been hunting that one since 97. And there are two, basically there's two different bedding areas on, on both sides of this um, ridge. And where I have my mock scrapes, the scent, the, no matter which way the wind's blowing, the scent goes into those uh, bedding areas. And um, so I can, I can hunt that top of that ridge in the, in the morning with the thermals coming up without really having any issues or problems. And, um, you know, I, I'll usually see them coming up out of the ridge and they'll just, they'll hit the two, three, four scrapes on their way through right up the main trail to where they like to go. And, uh, you know, it always puts them in 15 to 20 yards of, of range. And I said, I, I tried to just make sure that they can't get around behind me because you know how they like to swing around behind you. Um, and get on that downwind I, side. Yeah, get on that downwind side. And, and uh, um, you know, just just have, have, have consistency with your, with your scent yourself and, you know, trying to not mess up your mocks. I don't, I, I no longer pee in my own mock scrapes anymore um because your pee breaks down in about starts breaking down in 20 minutes so i said i just i use it i use interdigital and um like i said i will i will walk those i'll oftentimes have deer walk right to the bottom of my tree or to my ladder because there's still stuff on 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 the boots once you take it off bucks yeah and and the young bucks you know and they'll come in and they'll lick the bottom of the ladder and you're like yeah go go away but you know, you got to put all that stuff in there, you know, to find that perfect, that, that perfect setup where they can't, they can't get behind you downwind and it forces them to come into those, to those scrapes in, in front of you. And again, it, it takes, it takes a lot of knowing your property and, and, um, you know, some, some trial and error and, and, you know, using the thermals and, and again, trail cameras are just the ticket right now. Um, you know, you, you, I had two or three bucks that were starting to go get on their feet between, you know, nine and 11 hitting uh, one particular scrape. And I told my secretaries at school, I'm taking a day off November 5th on a Friday. <laughs> and they're like, you never take a day off. I said, I haven't had a day off since the pandemic. I'm taking it. And I said, I'll call you by noon with pictures of a deer. I, I killed my deer. I think at nine 30. Um, <laughs> showed up. Came in, caught. Yeah. Came in, caught the, caught the scent of, of, of the scrapes that had been hit and that, um, doing a digital with heat. And I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't handle it. And after I even shot him, I sat in the stand for longer and I had three other smaller bucks come right in the same way, um, you know, and, and come check the decoy out. So, and I, I mean, Northwest Pennsylvania is not a predominant area where I say, Oh yeah, I'm going to use a decoy and kill it. But, you know, I, I think with this stuff and what you can do with it, um, as, as part of your setup, you know, and I wasn't in, I was in the timber. I wasn't in a, you know, a corner of a field or this or that. Um, my, my property and places are pretty thick and I call it the doe nursery because that's how from now until September, that's all we'll usually see. Um, 90% of the time bucks will pass through at night and hit scrapes and stuff like that. But with them dropping their fawns and everything, they pretty much have the bucks run out. And on the, south side of my property it's usually beans or corn on the north side of my property the ag is usually beans or corn and they're not dumb they bed down 20 yards in the timber from those beans and don't worry about it but 
you know, uh, I've put a lot of work into it with planting different trees. I put a 110 gallon water hole in there on uh, small food plots in there. And, you know, they travel the paths and hit the scrapes to get into the food plot and drink water and, and go on the merry way. So uh, a lot of times when it's me and my daughter and my son, we'll be sitting in different stands and we're like, did you see that buck? No, I didn't see that buck. Well, it came to this scrape. And so we got, you know, a lot of eyes on, on different scrapes and cameras on scrapes and you can put all the pieces together and, and time it right to, to have a really good opportunity in archery season. That's awesome. And I think it's a very effective way of doing it. And I don't think a lot of people understand the way that mock scrapes work or scrapes work in general. Um, yeah. And I think, I think, you know, obviously, you know, like we're kind of winding down on the, on the podcast side, but I know that you have a lot of other books and a lot of really good other information um, for people to kind of learn in the things that you've written over the years. Yeah. I, I actually have a YouTube channel called um, the power of gland lore where I, I do, I run a lot, I run a lot of stuff uh, and talk about, Hey, this is this gland. And, you know, here's how I do mock scrapes and here's, how I do vines and here's where I, uh, I do those. So, I mean, people can get on there and, and get information. Um, I have a website, um, www.litfoutdoors.com, where I have um, a link to uh, YouTube pages. You can get uh, videos. Uh, as I said, you know, my this book that I did for Smokey, I have it in paperback, but I also have it in uh, an ebook, a PDF file ebook. Uh, and again, and it, you'll get it in color. And black and this is in black and white the other one's in in color and um you can go and there's a lot a lot of my blogs that i've done on my website talk about gland lore and, and mock scrapes and uh and, and different things and stuff like that and 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 people can email me I, I never hesitate i i would say on on a good week i'll have i don't know half a dozen people call me and ask questions about uh about stuff and i have a, a a pretty decent library of older books and it is funny from even like the 80s and 90s how little they knew about scrapes and you know everyone knew about tarsal glands um you know but how it's transitioned into you know preorbital salivary you know uh, you know there's eight glands that they use but when you when you understand them and put the pieces together you go oh i i understand why that deer did that um and i, under, I understand why it's doing that you know people say oh i shot that deer that doe because it was stomping its foot at me well you should because it just polluted that whole area and then said hey there's danger all through here um that i would say is the only issue i would have with people who are starting with gland lore is you only need to use a tiny tiny little bit um we've had people say i use that whole bottle so well, you might as well go cement that place over because nothing's going to come in in there because deer don't leave that much you know you get you get eyedroppers in smoky stuff and you, you you only use like when i do interdigital in this in this in uh, scrape i put um four drops where a front foot would be and four drops where uh another, the left and right feet would be and four drops where the back feet would be so you're thinking okay that's that's a total of 16 drops and a drop isn't very big so you got you got to really you know, less is best when it comes to gland lore and you don't have to worry about it. You know, it doesn't go bad. It doesn't turn well, unless you leave it in the sun or leave it open all the time uh, or freeze it. You don't want to freeze it, but all smoky stuff is, is natural. And he actually is the only one who has a patent for his process of how he makes his preorbital. Um, but yeah, if you're going to just do a beginning mock scrape, preorbital is the way to, way to, way to go and way to start and, before you go do anything you know check out some videos and and you know how to entice deer to come to your visit your mock scrape again get rid of all of the other branches that they can get to so that yours is just the only one there that they can come and um like i said you'll have a lot of good success you can go to buckstick.com has uh, a way you know a one two three easy method to do they have a a vertical um mock scrape i guess what do you call it? there's leaves at the top and some coconut rope and a forehead area strip and a little pad at the bottom you can put in your digital i've had a lot of really good success with that with that i've done a lot of work with them 
Um, they have a horizontal one as well you can use. And uh, they're looking at some other things that we've been talking about, and some new ideas and prototypes and, and different things. But I would say get yourself some good cellular cameras so you don't have to go into woods very often. Um, make your scrapes, let them go. When you notice they're not getting hit, go freshen them up. Um, some guys like to go about every three weeks. But again, if it's during the summer and everything, I don't, I don't, I don't bother it. Um, and then again, you can switch the buck, the your vines around. Use different. Uh, get two bottles of pre-orbital. Or, um, get some of the Wicked Wicks. It's it's a bigger bottle, but it's five bucks. It's five bucks in one bottle. So you now you're, you're introducing five bucks at once instead of one. So you have a Ruser buck who's in a you know core area or whatever you can you can you can all drive him a little bit crazy when he's like how oh, what okay now there's five different deer in here so they know they they can pick out you know the individual scent of of who is who is who and who's been passing through and who's doing what so that's awesome man well i our one last question for you and we ask everybody this is is what drives you outdoors brian what drives me outdoors uh, to be honest, I'd say it was, it's my faith. Um, did it pause out? It did. Oh, did we go too long? I'm sorry. No, you're good. No, it literally no, just good. paused. <laughs> it paused right. for a second. So, so what drives you out? And you said, you said your faith. Honestly, my faith. And then it paused perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just my faith. I said, I love sitting in the morning watching things come alive knowing that you know there's a you know i have a strong belief that there's a creator that created all this and he made everything the way it is and it's it's our job to take care of it and do the best with with what we can and you know that's where the whole conservation thing thing comes in with with being hunters as well you know we hunt for those resources and everything but we're also the biggest conservationist uh, on the planet so you know that uh that that time to just sit relax connect with nature connect with god you know just just relax and look at everything around that's been created that's that, that honestly that's that's really what what drives me you know I'm, I'm like a lot of people i don't have to see anything on a hunt i'm going to get refreshed i'm going to get vital revitalized i'm going to you know have a recharged battery just because of what i've been able to experience and 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 see in in the outdoors that's beautiful so as far as social media goes, how can people find you if you have any? Um, I, I have um, Left in the Field Outdoors um, on Facebook. Um, I, uh, that's, I also have it on uh, Instagram. And um, I have my website, www.litfoutdoors.com. Um, what else? I got some stuff on, um, some podcasts and stuff on some different places where I talk about those. I also have them listed on my website. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, YouTube, uh, left in the field outdoors and again, uh, power of gland lore. And I don't know, you see me in some magazines here and there with some different articles, but, uh, yeah, people can email me. I don't know. I get, I get people, people that walk up to me and, you know, look that I'm wearing hunting stuff and be like, Oh, Oh, I've heard of that. Cause I mean, it's a lot of local people in, in PA, but um, yeah, social media is, is probably the, the biggest in with Instagram. I haven't ventured into the TikTok thing yet. And I don't know if I will, but uh, I, go wild. I'm on, I'm on go wild, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, I said, and I can send you guys information on that. If you want to post that with, with anything, but um, yeah, if you, if, and if you even, people even Google mock scrapes, usually I pop up there in some of the first few things some of my mock street videos have a few thousand views for for different things so yeah i i think it's safe to say that your your name pops up a little bit here and there just yeah. just a little bit which is a, a big reason why we wanted to have you on is really start educating people that if this is a route you want to go that you know now's the time to start getting ready get these early season setups start Yep. Educating the deer now yep. to be yep. successful early in the season. And that, yep. that like kind of goes can... with our theme for the last couple of episodes. So we appreciate it. Yep. Yeah. I said, you're just, you're just 
doing your best to steer the deer where you want. And it's funny, you'll get up in your stand and go, oh, that's a pretty good spot right there. I think I, I could kill a deer out of there. And lo and behold, yeah, you, you, you can. If you, if, you do, if you do it right and you're very careful, you know, you, you, can, you can do that. And then you get some surprises every once in a while. So <laughs> It happens. Of, of that's what, hunting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, and I would, if you live in an area where there's lots of bears, bears love preorbital for whatever reason so you need you need to be care you need to be careful you'll get a lot of bears coming to your mock scrapes and batting things around and hitting things um we don't have a ton of bear in my area but usually every year on my property or the other one i hunt um i'll get bears in chewing on my vines and and everything else they they do um smoky goes up to maine and snares bears with his Ooh. stuff that he makes for bears yeah He'd, he's got some great stories about that. Yeah, he's he's definitely a, a very prolific trapper when you're talking about snaring, <laughs> snaring bears. That's, he, that's, geez, that's a whole new level. Yeah, that's he's, a whole he's, new human. He's he's darn he's darn good at it. He's he's had good success with that. So, you know, you find you find yourself good product that works for you that's natural that doesn't have any additives or any other, you know, junk in it, and you know. Just read some books, read some articles. Everyone's different. You know, a lot of people are like, I don't use scent. Uh, great. If you have success without using any type of scent, um, you know, that's great. Me, I use it because like I said, I seriously, other than one year, uh, I've killed a deer out of a mock scrape every year, but one and since 2011. So a lot of my buddies after four or five years are like, okay, how you doing? I said, it's this stuff right here. And Two of my buddies are like, I'm going to try it. And they're, they've been doing the same thing since. So, awesome. you know, you know I, 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 can't, I can't tell you the last time I used urine just because I, I just, I don't know. I just don't. The proof is in the pudding. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't. I don't. You're, feel like you're not the government. I, don't fix it till it's broke. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey. I'm I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Yeah, that's the last. Yep, thing you famous want last to hear. words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, Brian. Well, again, we want to thank you for jumping on here with us tonight. You've really shared a lot of really useful knowledge. Some stuff that I know I can add into what I do, and I know Trev's already adding it into what he does. So we look forward to seeing what it produces. And if you guys have any questions, look into his websites. His instagram his youtube you know follow the train and get the information you want if you want to go down this route because it's proven it's successful and for some people that's just the way they hunt but until then guys we just really want to thank you for hanging out listening hope you got something out of us and uh thanks for taking the ride right here on the outdoor drive <laughs>